look on the screen with me. Can you tell me what letter that is? I heard a little voice say it quick, I think. It's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, it's the letter A. Now, I got to be careful because Addie starts kindergarten in, in the fall, and uh, her teacher is right over here, so I may get corrected. But what does the A say? It says, ah. Good. All right, can we repeat that? Ah. All right. Some of the teachers in here are like, what is going on? When the, when the pastor's gone, the youth pastor plays. All right. And then the next letter is the letter B, and it says, ba. Everybody say, ba. ba. That's good. Daylight saving time didn't affect us. We're doing really well. What about the letter C? It says, k. k. That's the sound some of y'all made just a minute ago when I was teaching you the alphabet. And the letter D is... I was actually informed by my wife, who taught for five years, that it's d, not duh. <laughs> Just, so some of you guys, you said duh, and it works because you know this, right? Like it would be absolutely absurd for me to spend the next little bit going through the alphabet with people who learned it years ago, right? Like there, there's no point. You know it. What's the point of it? But if I were to put a different spin on it, um, a few years ago, I, I took 35 weeks of Haitian Creole classes. And that's a different alphabet, a little bit different. They actually have other letters too. After C comes CH, the letter CH. Sh, right? And so if I were to teach you the Haitian Creole alphabet, I bet you would be a little bit more attentive at that because by the time we get to about M, if not earlier, some of you might be walking out of here if I'm teaching you the English alphabet, right? But if it's something new and you're looking at it from a new perspective, then you'll probably be a little more patient. We're kicking off a series this morning over the next few weeks called The Basics. And this is going to look at the basics of Christianity. And our goal is not to insult anyone's intelligence, but here is something that I've noticed with a lot of Christians, myself included, is that very often after we've been following Christ for a long time, we treat some of the basics of Christianity as though it's the alphabet that we learned a long time ago. What's the point of reviewing it? Why do we need to look at it again? I already know all of this stuff, but what I've found in 25 years of following Christ is that even revisiting some things that, yeah, I know these things, God can still speak to us in a mighty way when we dig into his word at really what these things mean. So we're going to look today at salvation. That's where we're going to start. We're going to start with what is salvation? Now again, for I believe most of us in this room, we could come up with a really good definition and description of biblical salvation. What does it mean to be saved according to the Bible? I would venture to say we could get it very right in a room like this with the people who are in here. And yet, it's still really important for us to make sure, first off, that we really know what biblical salvation is. But secondly, maybe you have been saved for a long time. You've been a Christ follower for many, many years. How do you explain it to somebody? There's some benefit to being able to, to learn to explain it to people because you know, we are on mission as Christ followers. And this is the mission that all people need to be saved, that we get to be a part of. Of that. And so this morning we're going to dive into what is salvation. I remember when I was about five or six, I had just been saved, um, accepted Christ after church camp. And I remember going home and I was talking to a kid from my church. We were about the same age. I was probably about six at the time. And I was like, Seth, are you saved? And I remember vividly him going, well, there was one time I was in my backyard and I fell into the swimming pool and someone had to rush out there and they saved me. And I remember my little mind at the age of six was going, I have no idea 
where to go from this moment. Because we are talking about two different things with the same word. Now, it's very important to understand when we're talking about what it is to be saved or what salvation is, we are obviously not, not talking about this earthly rescue that may happen where you're trapped in something and someone has to save you. But when we're speaking of salvation, we are talking about what the Bible says it is to be saved. The penalty of our sins, the separation from God that we experience because of our sin. And we have to be saved. We need a savior to fix what sin broke. Because it doesn't take us long to figure out by looking at the world, things are kind of messed up. Sin impacted everything. It changed the world in every single way, even us. Now, the standard of which we are judged by is not our neighbor. Because if you're like me, I live in a neighborhood where on Sunday mornings, now granted, we leave a little bit earlier, but we also come home and I'm like, I don't know that many of my neighbors are church attenders. And so immediately for me, I could be like, well, I've got one up on them, but the standard of goodness is not my neighbor because I attend church. The standard of goodness is Jesus Christ. And we realize, especially through the book of Romans, that everyone is a sinner. That is who we are at our core. We are a sinner. That is not the most popular statement that will ever be uttered, but it's the truth. We are all sinners And because of our sin, we are separated from God. And there's nothing that we can do in our own power. Being in this room this morning, it doesn't do anything for us to make us right with God. And there's nothing we can do, no amount of money we can give, no place we can go, no words that we can say that appease God. It's simply, as the Bible points out, that it's Jesus Jesus lived a perfect life, never sinned, and he paid the price on the cross for us to be made right with God through faith. And that is what it saves us from, is the fact that we are saved from the penalty of our sin, which is eternal separation from the holy God who loves us so much. And so when we speak of salvation, we are talking about being saved from the penalty of our sins. And so this morning, I want to look very quickly at three different things as you look at the word salvation according to the Bible. It is used a lot. If you look up the Greek word in the New Testament, it is used throughout the New Testament multiple times. And what I've done is I've tried to narrow it down into three different ways that the word salvation is used. The first thing that we find about salvation is that salvation is rooted in belief. It is rooted in belief. In Acts chapter 16, there's a story of Paul and Silas. And if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard the story. Paul and Silas are in the city of Philippi. And as they're going through Philippi, they encounter this girl with some supernatural powers through evil spirits. And they cast this demon out of this little girl and it creates this uproar in the city. And as they're going through the city and they're preaching the truth of Jesus, the Roman people are like, we don't like this. They're creating all this uproar and they get thrown into prison there in Philippi. And so as they're sitting in Philippi, it's about midnight and they're doing what any good Christian would do as they are chained to the walls in prison, being persecuted, probably beaten. They're probably sore and they're singing worship songs to God at midnight right? I mean, we would all, we would all do that, right? And so there, there they are, they're chained to the walls singing songs, and suddenly the ground begins to shake, and an earthquake happens. Now, we don't know the total devastation of the earthquake, but it was strong enough to open up all the doors and loosen them from their chains. Now, the guard, the jailer who is in charge of keeping all of the prisoners, recognizes that the prisoners have been set free at this point. And if you're a jailer, you have one job, which is to not let the prisoners be set free. And I just failed at that. And so it's better for me to end my own life than to face the people who are going to punish me. And so the Philippian jailer grabs his sword and we find that he's about to end his own life when he hears a voice. And Paul says, hey, 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 we're all here. Calm down, buddy. 
And the jailer rushes into this room and he finds these prisoners, Paul and Silas, after they have been praising God, singing worship to him, and he recognizes immediately that God has done something supernatural and magnificent in that jail. And he falls before Paul and Silas, and in verse 31, he says, or in, in verse 30, he says, guys, what, what do I need to do to be saved? Now, Paul and Silas were not threatening his life, so he wasn't saying, let me go, what do I have to do to be saved, spare my life? But instead, as they were singing, as they were worshiping, as he witnessed everything that had just happened, he recognized that there was a God in heaven and he owed his life to him. And that if he did not trust him, that he was going to be separated from God. He was about to face God's judgment is what he realized. And he said, what do I have to be, what do I have to do to be saved from God's judgment? And in verse 31, look at what Paul tells him. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And we find that as Paul says this, the Philippian jailer takes Paul and Silas into his own home. He cleans them up. He meets their family. They continue to explain the gospel. And it says that night, this Philippian jailer and his entire household were saved. They became Christ followers that very night. Now, I think that we all understand that belief is not just a mental affirmation of Jesus. Like, do you believe in Jesus? Yep. Like, and that's easy. And there's a lot of people who believe that Jesus existed. There are history books outside of the Bible that testify to the fact that Jesus existed. In the first century, there was a man named Josephus who wrote and he talked about Jesus, but he was Jewish. He didn't affirm that Jesus was the son of God. So he may have believed that Jesus existed, but he didn't believe in this way. And we understand that belief has to go so much deeper than us just saying, yeah, I know about Jesus. I mean, I know about a lot of things. But as we talked um, a few months ago, whenever I preached, we talked about belief, that belief goes so much deeper. It's more than just head knowledge. In fact, if you look at the, the word belief, as it's used in, in the Greek here, it actually means to place confidence in. And so what Peter, or what Paul is saying to the Philippian jailers, he, he says, listen, you got to place all of your confidence in Jesus. You put all of your trust in Jesus. You were persuaded of Jesus, that he is the son of God and the Messiah, that he came to earth to live a perfect life and die on the cross to take the sin of the entire world placed on his shoulder. And he faced the full wrath of God to satisfy the punishment for your sin. That's what you have to believe. And it says the Philippian jailer did that very thing that night. And so it's not just this mental affirmation that Jesus was some historical figure because that won't get us anywhere. But we understand that when it says to believe in Jesus, we are talking about an entire life of belief and trust that is placed in the person of Jesus Christ. And whenever we fully believe who Jesus is, Understand that he is the son of God, that he is God who came to earth to live the life that we could never live. Then that leads us to the second thing that we find of belief, and that's repentance. Belief, belief is what salvation is rooted in, but whenever salvation comes, it requires repentance. In Acts chapter two, we find the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And if you've been here over the past couple of months, Pastor Ken has been going through a series on the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? And all these different topics. But in Acts chapter two, we find when the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers in the early church, Jesus had ascended into heaven. He said, you go and you wait for the helper. You wait for my spirit to come among you. And that's what we find in Acts chapter two. And they're gathered in this room together. And all of a sudden, there's a sound of a rushing wind, and, and it's the best description that we have. And suddenly, all of these Christ followers of Jewish heritage, probably Hebrew speakers, are now able to speak all of these myriads of different languages. Because all of these people had come in to Jerusalem from other nations, 
And now they're able to go out and speak the languages of these people who had come into Jerusalem to give them the gospel. Like, do you realize the absurdity that's happening right now? It would be like us, we, so we partner with Oasis International downtown in Bevo Mill, very uh, high number of nationalities in that area. Mark Akers, the founder, I think it was a couple years ago, they had like 34 different nations come through. All right, very few English speakers. And imagine if we took 34 people down to Oasis International and one by one as people came in, suddenly someone was like, I got this, I learned Swahili just now. And you go over and you start speaking Swahili. And you're like, I don't, where'd you learn that? I don't know, it just came to me. Like that's the picture that is happening and you're able to share the gospel with someone. Do you think that would create a little bit of buzz in the area for like, this guy is speaking perfectly fluent whatever language. I think people are gonna notice, especially the people that you're speaking to. And so it creates this, this buzz that's going on and all these people are saying, what is going on? Well, Peter, the coward before Jesus was crucified, now boldly stands up and he says, guys, I'll tell you what is going on. He begins to trace through the Old Testament, starting in the book of Joel, where God promised that he would pour out his spirit upon all people. And he, he traces through it and helps them to understand this is a prophecy that is fulfilled before you today, that God promised this was gonna happen. Here's the verses and here is how it happened. And then he continues and he says, and let me tell you about Jesus. And he, he begins to explain the gospel that God sent his son Jesus to the earth to die in our place. And that our sins separate us from a holy God and that we are in need of a savior. And at the end of this message, thousands of people are listening and the crowd says they're cut to the heart. They're convicted. They understand their sin and the weight of their sin. And it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? How can we be saved? We realize that we're separated. How can we be saved? And look what Peter says. And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. And so we begin with belief, understanding who God is, but once you understand who God is and his great love for you through Jesus Christ coming to earth, it leads us to the place of repentance. We are cut to the heart and say, what do we have to do? We have to repent. Now, for those that have grown up in the church, the word repent is familiar, but I gotta be honest, when, when I think of the word repent, it's not always the greatest image that comes into my mind. Like we don't use the word repent very often because I, I think people are scared of it. There's, there's people who have preached some very angry messages and they've picketed with signs and it says repent, turn or burn. And sometimes I think that gets like ingrained in our mind and like, oh, we gotta be careful about saying that word repent, which is really weird because it's just been like commandeered by this side over here that's really angry. But the word literally just means to change one's mind. That's what Peter says. He says, it's, you, you gotta change your mind. Micah just quoted Romans chapter 12, verse one and two. It says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Repent, change your mind, change the way that you think because changing the way that you think changes the way that you live. And so Peter is calling the people to repent, to think differently, about their sin and their relationship with God, understanding that they are sinners and that they need a savior. So if it means to change one's mind, maybe you've heard the illustration of it. It's like making a 180. All right, so going with this imagery, if this side over here is me going towards sin to change my mind, is simply to change directions. You know what you can't face at the same time? I can't face this wall and this wall at the same time. It is impossible, no matter how hard I try, and some of you are like, I wanna see you try, but no matter how hard I try, I cannot look both directions at once. And that's that imagery of repentance is that sin represented over here and Jesus over here. You cannot 
absolutely cannot pursue sin and Jesus Christ at the same time. They are polar opposites. They are complete opposite of one another. And so when Peter says repent, he says, listen, you're going this way. You're going towards sin. You were pleasing the flesh. You were doing what you want to do, but you have to change directions and you have to follow Christ. And whenever you change directions and you follow Christ and pursue Jesus, sin is at your back and you are no longer pursuing it. And Peter says, repent. Throughout scripture, the message of Jesus, the message of John the Baptist, the message of the apostles in the New Testament is repent, change your mind, change your direction, change the, the focus and your purpose and the way that you walk, the way that you live has to be changed. And so let's be honest this morning, isn't that one of the hardest things as a Christ follower? Because I don't know about you, I... I relate to the words of the Apostle Paul, who Paul in the book of Romans chapter seven, he talks about this inner struggle that goes on in his life. He says, the things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. And the things that I want to do, I don't do them. Paul is like, I, I feel this tension, this struggle where it's like sin entices me and I don't want to do it, but I find myself doing it and it's just this inner struggle. And it's not one of those where it's like, well, was Paul saved? Paul was saved, okay? We can, we can be assured that Paul was a Christian and a Christ follower and a strong Christ follower and he still struggled with that. And I find myself in that place so often, but you know what it is? Repentance is not, well, I did it when I was five and I never have to worry. It's a daily walk with Christ because you know what? I find myself daily just going, oh no, I, I, I gotta deny myself and I have to follow Christ. And that is what repentance is. It's a daily changing of your mind, waking up every day and saying, today is another day in which I'm going to pursue Christ. And the bottom line is we have to turn away from our sins and wholeheartedly pursue Jesus. Jesus, as he's teaching about what, what it is to follow him, the cost of following him, he says, no one who puts their, their hand to the plow and then looks back is worthy to follow me. Can you, I mean, oh, I want Jesus, but man, I want that too. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to fall off the stage. I'm not going to be able to see where I'm going because I'm, I'm looking in the wrong direction. I'm pursuing two different things. We have to wholeheartedly pursue Jesus. And I want to look at one more thing about repentance because repentance, as Micah just stole the thunder a few minutes ago, it leads to transformation. Repentance leads to transformation. Look what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When we are saved by Jesus, it transforms our lives. We are different people. We are different from the world. We are different from society. We are different from culture. And that doesn't mean some absurd thing where you go out and live in the woods by yourself. We live in the world, but man, we are set apart as followers of Jesus and we please Jesus and not what we want. Now, for me, this is a struggle because I was saved. I accepted Christ when I was five years old. Monterey, Tennessee, in my bedroom, my parents came in. We prayed late at night. I remember that night. And the worst thing that I did before I was saved was like lie or something like that. Like I don't, I don't have that story of like, oh, I was wrapped up in drugs and rock and roll. I was five, okay? <laughs> I lied and fought with my brother, right? But you know what? The sin in my life is just as heinous to God as the worst of the worst that we find in society. My life has been transformed by Jesus and the number of times in my life where it's like the opportunities to sin, to deny yourself and say, no, I am transformed, I will not, but I have repented and I pursue Jesus. It's a transformed life. We don't all have to have some great story that you see and you hear but you know what? I'm glad that at five years old, I found Jesus Christ because it saved me in that moment. And I haven't had to go through some of the heartache. I remember 
hearing people who, who they got saved later on in their life. They're like, if you could go back and do anything you know, different. And I remember one man who was saved in his 70s, he said, I would have done it a lot sooner. It's transformational living. And so the question is, how does your life look different since you accepted Christ? Does your life look different since you have accepted Christ? And see, repentance is not just asking to be forgiven of our sins. That's a part of it. But it's not just saying, oh God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You can apologize for things and not truly turn away from them. And those are just empty words, but instead it's brokenness over our sins and the punishment that we rightfully deserve, understanding the severity. I've told the teenagers so many times lately, we do not take our sin as seriously as God takes sin. Like it, it is an affront to God. God hates sin. It separates us from God. And even me, I, I'm not saying you guys, I'm saying it's embarrassing how often I look at my life and be like, ah, not that big of a deal. But see, transformed living, it changes everything. And it only comes through Jesus, which is our final point. Salvation is exclusive, exclusively through Jesus. In Acts chapter four, right after Acts chapter two, we find that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, Peter preaches a great message, 3,000 people are saved, 3,000 people are saved that very day, and so they continue to minister and they're going in to the temple, to the Jewish temple, the people who do not believe that Jesus is the son of God. And Peter and John, as they're walking into the temple, they see a lame man who sat outside the gate of the temple begging for money and goods and whatever he could get. And people would give, I mean, he was a beggar. And Peter and John are walking in and this guy's like, hey, you got anything? And Peter says, listen, I don't have any silver or gold, but I got something better. And he says, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Now this guy is well known I mean, he's been sitting out there. Everyone's passed him. They know he's been begging. And suddenly, the next thing they see is he's inside the temple running laps and jumping and screaming and praising God because he's like, look at this. And so this creates a little bit of a buzz, a little bit of a distraction. Peter and John are, are arrested, and the next day they're put on trial. They're standing before the council, and they said, hey, in what name did you do this? How did you do this? And Peter once again, boldly stands before them and look at Acts chapter four, verses 10 through 12. He says, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This man was healed by the name of Jesus. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And here it is. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter lets them know that salvation is only through Jesus. Now I realize this morning, I am probably preaching to the choir. A big echo chamber here. Like everybody's like, yeah, we know. Of course, like no one's in here like, but what about... What about Muhammad? Like, I don't think many people, but, but maybe you're here this morning going, okay, I, I don't know about this whole, like, only Jesus, don't all roads lead to heaven? Like, isn't it just about being a good person? Listen, folks, there's a lot of people in our culture who, who they struggle with this very thing of exclusivity of Jesus. And there is room for everyone at the table to come here. But I want to be very clear in our church, we believe what scripture teaches that it is only through Jesus. No other roads lead to God except through Jesus. In fact, Jesus said the very thing. In John chapter 14, he's speaking to his disciples. They said, you're going to prepare a place for us. How do we get there? And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a pretty exclusive claim from the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus at least thought that he was the only way to God. And I believe that it's affirmed over and over and over again that Jesus is the only way to God. 
probably the most well-known scripture in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but what? To save the world through him. The world will be saved through Jesus, not through good works, not through church attendance, not through giving money, not through saying the right words. It's only through faith in Jesus. I like this one, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gives us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. It sounds like the Bible is very clear that salvation only comes through Jesus and Jesus only. And again, I, I know most of us in here this morning are going, yeah, that's true. But why do we live as though that's not true? We try to find our hope and our purpose and our freedom, our fulfillment in things other than Jesus. We would never actually verbally say it and we wouldn't even think it of, oh, this will bring me salvation. We, we go to church and we go through the motions. I'm a Christ follower. But listen, our practice looks a lot different whenever we begin to invest in things that really don't matter. And it's only through Jesus that true life is found. And that's really how we're going to close up. It's true life is found in salvation. That's exactly what Jesus says. True life is found in salvation. You see, we, we live in a world full of frauds. One of my, my mentors in ministry, he was in Greece a few years ago. And he was walking by and he had this sign and he took a picture of it. And it said, genuine fake watches. <laughs> genuine fake watches. You see, what's happened is our culture has fed us this lie that we can find freedom, hope, fulfillment, salvation, meaning, and purpose, how to get to heaven, how to be happy, the true meaning of life, the best of everything, and that it will come through all of these other things. That real life happens whenever you do this. Just do what you want. Just no one, no one can judge you. Don't, don't judge anybody. Like They're free to do whatever they want. They can make their choices. Let them do whatever they want. It won't hurt anybody. And yet Jesus says, that, that's, that's not true. Look at Mark chapter 8. Verses 34 and 35, Jesus says to this large crowd, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Jesus says, true life comes when your life is no longer yours. That's when real life begins, when you take your hands off of your life and say, God, here it is. Give it up to him. And as you look at this, I mean, look at the way that Jesus describes these things. He talks about belief. You have to place your full confidence in Jesus to give your life up to him. That you're gonna trust him on the worst days just as much as you do on the best days. I mean, when things are going good, we all have an easy time trusting Jesus. Bless the Lord, hallelujah, right? Like, it's really easy to, to sing, oh, praise the name on the best days. But you know, it's a whole lot harder when things are just terrible. To go, oh, God is good. But see, God doesn't change. He's still the same God on the bad days as he is the good days. And so when you move to that place of placing your full confidence to be persuaded of him that he is in control, that is trust when you go, okay, God, here, here's my life. You do with it as you want to do. You do with it as you please. He talks about repentance. If I'm going to deny myself, because you know what? There are so many times in my life and in your life where this sin, it looks good and it feels good. Once heard somebody say, the devil's really good at his job. Sin's fun. 
if sin were boring, it wouldn't be as appealing, right? Like sin is enticing. It pleases our flesh, but just for a moment. But we forget that in the moment. And God says, deny yourself. Deny yourself. You are not as important. You are second. You follow me first. Deny yourself. Repent. Change your mind. Change your direction. Pursue me. Take up your cross. This is one that's always kind of thrown me for a loop, just to be honest, because this is before Jesus died on the cross. And so the meaning is much more significant to us. But could you imagine being a disciple? I mean, it, it would be like our modern day stuff of standing up here and be like, listen, take up your electric chair. We're like, ooh, that is, that's morbid. <laughs> Like Jesus had not died on the cross. The cross had no significance to them at that moment. And he says, take up your cross. In other words, die to yourself. That is not a popular message, to die to yourself, to say, I am dead to myself. I don't pursue my wants. I don't pursue my hopes. I don't pursue my dreams. I don't pursue my job. I pursue Jesus. And then everything else falls into place. And he says, repent, put your full hope and trust in me. And whenever you give up every part of your life, then you find true life. But there's also the negative of if you try to hold on to your life and please the flesh and do what you want, you get to the end of your life and you find out there is no eternal life for you. There's eternal death, separation from God, his full wrath, his full judgment poured out on you. And so again, this morning, I, I realize speaking to the crowd at, at our church, I think almost everyone here would go, yeah, salvation, we got it. But the question is, what, what's out of balance? What areas is it that you're going, okay, I confess that I am saved, but you know what? I'm not placing my full hope and trust and confidence in the person of Jesus. I'm not denying myself to truly follow Jesus. Here in a moment, we'll have a time of invitation and invite you to come and to pray, and just make things right with God, to repent, to believe and commit your life anew to him. But maybe you're here this morning and, and you have never made a decision to follow Christ. Then the invitation is open for you as well, and someone will come pray with you. But I also want to make this opportunity. Pastor Ken and I were talking throughout this series, we're going to make ourselves available up front. I know that it's, it's kind of a thing where typically we go out in the lobby and we have conversations, but there's nothing more important than people having a right relationship with God. And if someone's coming in with questions, we welcome questions. We want to answer questions. And if we don't know them, we'll go to the scriptures and figure them out together. But we want to open up conversations if you have more questions about what it is to be saved. How can I be saved? And we want to have those conversations this morning. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a time of invitation. But if you have questions, follow in the service. Come down with no fear, no shame, and let's just have a conversation.